Okay. Welcome everyone to the uh, final presentation of the 2263 design class. I'm Professor Dennis White. The other lead instructor on this is Professor uh, Carlos Paz Soldat from Columbia University, and they're joining us online uh, today, and, and we'll be doing this. So there are about 20 students from MIT and about 10 students from Columbia participating in this class. And this is the outcome of this, which is they will describe to you. So I just want to put this into context of the fact that this is um, the latest in a series of um, innovations, uh, innovation-driven fusion designs that have come out of the class so over the last 10 years, including starting with Vulcan, which is the first one that considered the use of Revco superconducting magnet technology, ARC, which are all very familiar with, and other presentations that came along to the right here. So you'll see this last presentation, uh, Manta, which is what you're going to see today, was the outcome of the uh, boundary conditions that we provided, uh, that Carlos and I provided to the students with respect to the idea that the, the goal of this was going to be to take a look at using negative triangularity, high field tokamak, in order to be able to meet the requirements of the <laughs> by, the, by, the, by, the, by the NASA report for a fusion pilot plan. So what did that report ask for? So it basically took a look at what would be the technical and time requirements for putting a fusion pilot plan on the, to make electricity. Um, and the key targets for this fusion pilot plant was that it must have an electric gain greater than one, a net electricity greater than 50 megawatts electric, and it would be able to sustain that for three hours. But on a tritium, it would be able to sustain itself with respect to tritium fuel, uh, should have an overnight cost less than $5 billion and demonstrate successful operation of the device soon in several, at least one in several environmental sites. Just a quick note about the educational goals of this class is that it is a design class in the sense that we, we put forth this you know, rather high level requirement about what's going to happen, but we leave it to the students to figure it out and navigate their way through this. And the, the key is this is that they're actually learning and using modern computational tools. You will see these actually distributed throughout the talk, and they do those. And the idea is that they, while they work in subgroups, they have to intertwine their design features into a cohesive uh, and, and conceptual feature. I really want to give a big thank, thanks to the group leaders because this involves so many technical requirements around the use of those computational tools. So you see their names there. Thank you very much for all your contributions because they're really the ones that the, uh, the, the teaching and the mentoring to the students to be able to use all those tools. So without any further ado, I'll leave it to the students. All right. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you to everybody who's come today, both online and in person. We've accomplished quite a bit that we're very proud of, and having such a diverse audience to share what we've accomplished, it means quite a bit. So I'm going to take you through the key design features of Manta. Manta is, as Dennis alluded to, a fusion reactor project that is Finance of the NASA report. The NASA report is a government publication study to try and build that next generation of the nuclear fleet. So, number one, we've been able to draw the plasma out to a larger aspect ratio while keeping the elongation low. And using a negative triangularity cross section, which the core group will talk about, we've been able to accomplish the rest of these features while keeping the physics risk to a minimum. Number two, the power itself is actually variable between pulses or during operation, even though the diverter power exhaust solution it operates constantly. The plasma itself is pulsing, but the electricity generated is constant, and this is really excellent for dispatchability and reliability. Number four, the replacement strategy is highly modular, and so replacements are fast exchanges of components and not a protracted engagement with the devices inside the reactor. Finally, to talk about fuel, tritium is at a premium right now, and having a pilot plant that can be tritium positive is very helpful in order to make the fusion energy landscape more accessible after the device is completed. I want to draw attention to point two and point four because they're really good features for a pilot plant to exhibit, since we'll be able to further explore the design space once the reactor has been built by exchanging components and trying multiple concepts over the lifetime of the device. So let me take you through the agenda of the report. I'll give you a little overview of some of the modules and technical components that we've designed for the project, and then I'll hand it off to our technical teams for details. First, we'll hear from the core team who have a self-consistent physics solution
that the reactor will not melt. <laughs> The Neutronics team will take us through the Neutronic analysis, which shows that even in the worst sections of the device, the radiation load is manageable, but we've incorporated many self-shielding features to keep this as safe as possible during operation. In the same section, we'll also be talking about how the tritium breeding ratio is positive. Afterwards, we'll hand it off to maintenance where we'll talk about the modular sections and the options later on with this plan. Finally, we'll go to the integration group where we can talk about how all the major systems have been made compatible. And finally, the bottom line of this presentation is that even though Mansa is a prototype pilot power plant, we think that it will be under budget and is quite promising economically on its own. So let me show you the six components that we've integrated for this design. First, the core plasma, if you read overview, is deuterium and tritium based with a little bit of noble gas impurity to control energy radiation. Around that, we built a vacuum vessel out of advanced but realistic materials that can very easily handle the power that we're putting into it. That's going to be immersed in a fly blanket, which is sort of a reservoir. That reservoir contains a fluid called fly. It serves four key purposes. It's a coolant to the vacuum vessel to keep it functional. It is a heat transfer fluid that keeps the rest of the power plant supply. It is a radiation uh, absorbing shielding material, and it breeds the fuel that we need to keep the plant functional. All of those together fit into one single package that fits into the toroidal field magnet page on the left, TF magnets. They're responsible for maintaining the major shape of the plasma. TFs, the toroidal fields, keep the plasma pointed in the direction we want to optimize the heat exhaust. And finally, the central solenoid sits at the center and provides stability to the magnetic equilibrium. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to the plasma team and they'll talk about why the core scenario we have is succession. All ready. Is everyone ready on the MIT side? Yep. yep. That's good. Hey, everyone. We're the first group up and we'll be presenting our results on the core scenario development and edge integration. Next slide, please. To start, we want to motivate one of the key features of Manta, which is that it exclusively operates in the negative triangularity L mode regime. Now, this offers various uh, advantages over the typical positive triangularity H mode. Namely, we avoid producing edge localized modes. We have manageable diverter heat fluxes um, and improved confinement compared to the standard L mode. In this simulated plot at the bottom, we see that for similar normalized pressures, the core region sustains larger pressures in the NT L mode regime, as opposed to the pedestal region as we see in H mode. This lack of an edge transport barrier avoids the issues that come with it, uh, namely edge localized modes and impurity retention. Next slide, please. Now there's existing data from TCV and D3D that shows very compelling results. They've observed improved energy confinement with negative triangularity and weaker power degradation, which are both favorable attributes for a reactor scale tokamak. Uh, furthermore, the plot on the right also shows relatively high normalized um, performance compared to other flavors of discharges. So the data we have so far is promising and there's more data to come with the upcoming D3D campaign next month, which is incredibly exciting. So the fact that we've chosen to combine a radiative L mode regime and negative triangularity allows for us to have an adjustably power, uh, adjustable fusion power power plant uh, with constant scrape off layer power to the diverter. Um, the inductive pulsed L mode uh, means that we have no need for RF current drive and no H mode pedestal, which gives us our variable density. The variable density allows for variable fusion power output uh, and the fact that we use a variable radiative fraction, that is the uh, fraction of fusion power that goes to the scrape off layer, um, allows for a constant scrape off layer power as power is varied. The low scrape off layer power is also consistent with not having an H mode. The negative triangularity ensures that we won't accidentally access H mode and also improves the L mode confinement, which helps us lower the current at the same fusion power. So we've also chosen an inductive design uh, that motivates having a large aspect ratio, uh, that is a large donut hole. Um, increasing the major radius R uh, lets us get a larger central solenoid. Larger solenoids have larger uh, quantities of flux, which means we can drive more current for longer, which gets us longer pulses. Um, and keeping the minor radius, that's little a, small, um, means that we can control our plasma volume, which is the biggest cost scaling parameter as it goes with toroidal field magnet size. Sorry, 
here's a comparison between our negative triangularity uh, inductive and radiative L mode Manta core scenario with that of the original ARC tokamak, which was an H mode fully non inductive uh, core. So, as we can see, we have this variable power output between 250 and 500 megawatts. And we can achieve this with a constant power of the spray pump layer of 25 megawatts. And we do this by varying the fraction of impurities, uh, no, the density of impurities, which controls the fraction of our power that is radiated out. Uh, we have a higher aspect ratio than R, and that is consistent with what was motivated in the previous slide. And it has the added benefit of increasing our magnetic field on axis because there's less radio drop off. And finally, Manta has a lower confinement factor, and that's consistent with operating in L mode. So choosing the right elongation was a key optimization uh, problem in Manta. So having a having a larger elongation is always beneficial to the core in the sense that you can put more plas uh, more current through your tokamak, and you have a larger plasma volume, which both provide more future power. However, a larger elongation uh, makes your device more susceptible to vertical displacement events, which cause disruptions. And this effect is exacerbated at negative triangularity. So, as shown in this work by Song et al., as we go to increasingly negative triangularity, the largest controllable elongation that we can have reduces quite a lot. And so, in line with this work, we chose quite a conservative elongation of 1.4, which matches um, their results and basically reduces our risk of BDEs. And just for clarity, these different levels here represent a dimensionless measure of the amount of active control that you have in your tokamak. And since we're in a pilot plant scenario, we're sitting on the lower end of active control. Yeah. So with that said, to decide the actual operational regime of Manta, we use the zero-dimensional And with the tech works, there's been those as power balance using parabolic profiles. And we love these plots that show how heat vision parameters and machine vary with respect to temperature and density. Here we can see the auxiliary power in red, the fusion power in black, and the Q plasma and in green. Uh, and so, given the Manta design points that we just discussed in the previous slide, we can identify this operating point which shows a heat vision between 250 and 500 megawatts, keeping the auxiliary power. The possibility constant at 10 megawatts, thus giving us the QP between 25 and 50. Um, and so, with this said, it was then time to run some higher fidelity simulations. And to do that, we developed this first of a kind, first of a kind, fully consistent workflow, which couples together transport codes, GS Trinity in the core, and U Edge in the spring of their public flux regions, as well with the NHD stability code, blue, and the equipment solar cheese. And from this diagram, you can see how all of these codes work together to provide full coverage along the entire thing normalized minor radius. So on past the past separators. And this does allow us for a fully integrated design. So we conducted a full gyrokinetic ion turbulent transport simulations uh, using the GPU based code GX coupled with the Trinity transport solver. And um, these runs were under the assumption that we are using static, static density profiles that are consistent with experimentally observed L mode shocks at ASDEX. And um, we also used a static elect electron temperature profile uh, with adiabatic electrons. And these runs showed that we can achieve 400 megawatts of fusion and uh, average temperature of 25 keV. Now, in order to get a self consistent equilibrium at each step of this iteration process, we use the discrete pressure values of outputs from our transport calculations, so Trinity in the core and U edge for the pressure at the separatrix. And we fit a uh, smooth uh, pressure profile to these points. The only special region, I would say, being the region towards the edge where we fit a hyperbolic, modified hyperbolic tension function in order to uh, match the, the pedestal uh, form. Uh, an important point to mention here is that we actually lack enough experimental data to know how high of a pedestal we would actually get to such a high power negative triangularity uh, L mode uh, plasma. So we went with the conservative assumption of having a pretty uh, 
uh, low pedestal and a small density a pressure gradient at the edge. Uh, it's just conservative in the sense that a higher pedestal would typically give us a better performance. And we then uh, run our equilibrium through balloon, which is a, a ballooning stability code in order to confirm that H1 is indeed inaccessible in this uh, negative triangularity plasma. So as you can see on the right, uh, our pressure gradient at the edge is uh, below the lower boundary of the ballooning unstable region. And most importantly, uh, there is no uh, path uh, available to the second ballooning stability region, which means that the pressure gradient at the edge is going to be limited by the ballooning instability um, basically uh, prohibiting uh, high pedestals to form and inhibiting uh, H mode uh, access, which uh, is you know, exactly what we're looking really for in this case. So the result of consideration between Trinity, U Edge, and Blue uh, is the following cheese equilibrium profile. And you can see the um, pressure and Q safety factor profiles over uh, normalized rho. And then on the left, you can see the the Trinity profile and the pressure gradients um, that we traverse on uh, after consideration. So, with that said, we're going back to the talk about for a minute. Um, and the really attractive trend that we could read from the plot is that we can keep the auxiliary power fixed and the temperature relatively fixed. We can use density as a control knob to yield this uh, higher fusion power. And this is a trend that we've actually seen in the transport results doing a density scan. Note that here we're just comparing you know, the trends between these two and lines of the absolute values as the profiles are slightly different. But what this shows us is that we have a wide and flexible operating region that allows us to meet the mixed reports, and it lies in the temperature stable regions of this graph, which means we do not need to have a higher auxiliary power to reach a higher fusion power. So the lower hybrid system has also been incorporated to provide additional stability to neoclassical tearing modes that are common at the Q plus two surface. Uh, presently, we're coupling at 10 megawatts of RF power to our edge at most royal or about 0.84, and we're placing our launcher 30 degrees below the high field side of airplane. So that launcher placement is a result of angular optimization that was achieved peak power density, um, and it was found that approximately um, in that region uh, where we're sticking at 210 degrees loyal angle, we're able to access that peak power density region while also moving it far, uh, far away off the uh, midpoint where it's going to have uh, more common high intensity uh, resonant uh, uh, neutron flux. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand off to magnets. Hello. Uh, the magnet team will now talk about magnet design and joint, uh, demandable joints. Next slide. For the largest piece of magnets, the F coil, used to produce a larger on axis field, we have the following design goal in mind. It should include demountable joints and suitable for top down maintenance. A high magnet field of 11 Tesla with Repco superconducting tape on the plasma axis. A coil, uh, the coil will also use non insulated magnet design, allowing for improved quench resilience. A reasonable stress of 0 0.6 gigapascal on the magnet body, referenced by the max stress report from the arc fusion device. And lastly, a design goal, uh, a design goal of operating fraction of 0 0.6. From this, oh, uh, previous slide. From this, we have uh, chosen a rounded window frame as our magnet shape. Its simplistic shape allows easy manufacture process while providing enough space in the corner for the blanket and diverters. Also, uh, allowing joint to be placed on the top as a horn like structure for direct top down access. The mountable jo joint also, in addition, permit the placement of PF coils within the TF cage. Next slide. I think there's an error. There should be two pictures here. Uh, try clicking one. Uh, uh, a total of 18 TF coil are uh, deployed in this design, simulated in console. The magnet field simulation results shown on the left. Uh, this configuration gives us 24 Tesla max inboard field and 11 Tesla on the axis, as the uh, as the design goal specified. A one over R drop off on the field strength can be observed, as expected. Uh, the magnet and the casing have large curvature uh, on the corner. The top corner of the magnet case is also filled with steel, forming a rounded corner along the internal surface. Together with a D-shaped uh, supporting structure, we observe a 0 0.6 gigapascal mass stress as we uh, have set in the design goal, as shown on the right figure. All matching was our uh, design. Next slide. So a very important part of our maintenance scheme is this uh, access to the top of the vacuum chamber, which is from our joints. So the way that we're figuring out how to do those joints is using uh, the pancake structure within the 
the magnets uh, is integrated with solder joints. So each magnet is made of 18 pancakes, and each pancake is soldered from the with, between the deep U shape and the shallow U shape on the right there. Uh, they're soldered at the joint that is highlighted on the right if you lay the pancake down on its side. Uh, we, it uses low temperature solder. And the current is shown in the picture on in the middle as well. And if you'll notice, the current goes in opposite directions in the corners, which reduces the stress in the corners as well, which is another benefit of this design. The demand, the demountable joint technique was developed by more Theo Moritidis at PSFC. It's using a, a new technique that does low temperature solder in a vacuum pressure impregnation process. Next slide. So the central solenoid of our Menta device is quite interesting too, as you've heard before in this presentation, we have a fairly compact device, but at, low, at high aspect ratio. And what does that mean? It means we can fit a very large solenoid on the bore, which uh, within the operational limits of uh, Repco superconductors provides us 305 volt seconds of flux, which translates into an ohmic pulse that is 40 minutes long, plus uh, an additional, uh, that is afforded by lower hybrid. For comparison, uh, the ARC-1 paper states about 30 weavers. Um, we also consider that uh, we can have a pretty fast recharge rate. So that means the interpulse is gonna be fairly short, giving us uh, a lot of uh, duty factor. So can we build this solenoid? We've explored this through COMSOL and what we see here is a 2D axisymmetric um, simulation of the solenoid um, shown here. It's um, about seven meters tall by 0.3 meters wide. Uh, next to it, we have included the poloidal field coils uh, to consider their contribution to the Lorentz load, as well as uh, the plasma as a single turn 10 mega amp coil. Uh, and what we see is that when we also consider a sort of order zero uh, concept for uh, mechanical support that we're well below uh, the material limits of the uh, steels and epoxy that we might consider for those support structures. Oh. All right, so we've heard uh, from the core and the magnets group about how we'll be producing uh, fusion power. And so our group was in charge uh, of designing and uh, determining what the design constraints on the structural components uh, will be in order to be able to handle that power. Uh, so we thought about the power in terms of three different categories. If you click on the next slide, we have PSOL, which is power that's generated in the core and it's conducted onto open field lines. That power flows to the diverter targets. We have PRAD, which is power that's radiated from the core as a result of impurity seeding. And we have PN, that's power that is produced from 14.1 MeV fusion neutrons. And so we have to figure out how to exhaust these three different sources of power. So PSOL, we know, flows to the diverter targets. And so as a result, sets the diverter complexity and the lifetime of its structural components. PRAD forces us to actively cool the vacuum vessel, not just the diverter region, but also the main chamber. And finally, the power that comes from the neutrons constrains the polyidal field coil locations, how much current we can drive through them, and essentially the equilibrium that we can enforce in a diverter um, and in our plasma solution. And in dealing with the uh, power that Andres was just discussing, it turns out that negative triangularity L-mode operation is quite beneficial. So negative triangularity increases the major radius of the diverter and hence increases its circumference to spread out the heat flux. Additionally, more power from the core can be radiated in L mode than compared to H mode. So less power it even makes it to the diverter plates. And if we look at these two diverter metrics here shown in the table, um, we can see that in uh, Manta's case, they are significantly lower than in a device like Eater, which makes our um, diverter all the easier to construct and operate. And so our overarching goal for the diverter and floatal field coil set was to have as simple a solution as possible. <coughs> And in terms of the polyidal field coils, we're placing them inside of the TF cage. And this is made possible by the demountability of the toroidal field coils. We scope the locations and currents of the coils with 3GS. And we found that four sets of polyidal field coils, which you can see on the right, 
um, is able to achieve the desired plasma shape with acceptable coil currents. We then took the coil locations, passed them to Neutronics, who then validated that the lifetimes are sufficient for a pilot plant. And the diverter that these uh, portable field coils create features low technical complexity, um, which is quite a nice feature. All right. Let's talk about the model we're using so that by the end of the next few slides, we should all know whether or not our diverter will melt. I sure hope it doesn't. Let's click a couple of times. We started off with a couple of constraints from an example core case involving a scrape off layer power of 26 megawatts and a separatrix density of 9.6 10 to the 19. Click again. One more time. Now the main aim, uh, the name of the game, if you will, is to satisfy the inequalities in this big red box down here. Uh, essentially to prevent melting and sputtering of the tungsten plates, we need to keep our heat flux peak at the surfaces of our diverter plates to under 10 megawatts per square meter, which is roughly equivalent to keeping our surface temperatures at those plates below about five EV. Uh, click one more time. To that end, our main design knob that we can turn is a neon impurity fraction to increase the radiated power within the diverter region. In this case, the impurity fraction is just above 0.1%. Now, by now you're probably asking, David, we simply cannot wait any longer. Does it work or not? Well, the eagle-eyed observers might have already noticed in this plot of electron temperature, the inner leg is fully detached as evidenced by cooler temperatures all the way down to the inner plate. If we go to the next slide, we can see that yes, yes, it does in fact work. On the outer plate, our peak temperature or our peak heat flux reaches just 8.8 .8 megawatts per square meter. With the inboard plate fully detached, it's almost an order of magnitude below that across the board. Now it's worth noting a couple of assumptions that went into this model, since in order to use the U-edge tra fluid transport code, we need to set our transport coefficients. We did that in two ways. In citation one, there were some scaling laws for L mode that helped us set what's called the uh, heat flux width at the mid plane to roughly one millimeter, which is the characteristic distance over which the heat flux will fall off. Uh, that allows us to set our transport coefficients initially. And then we varied those transport coefficients in space to achieve a 70 30 split between the outboard and inboard total power handled by each plate. This is based on citation two and some projections involving the decreased uh, bad curvature in negative triangularity operation. Now we have one last thing to check. We can't forget about our plate temperatures. So on the next slide, we can see, lo and behold, our T max on the outer plate does not reach five EV. And on the inner plate, we're positively cool at less than two EV, or at least I think that's very cool. Now let's head on over to Harry to talk about how robust our situation can be going forward. Okay, so the power handling team then investigated how sensitive are these peak heat fluxes on other plasma parameters, such as the power through the scrape off layer and the fraction of neon impurities. And so to that end, we simulated several, uh, we ran several US simulations with different scrape off layer powers. And that's shown here in this graph. The different lines of different colors show different neon fractions. And the general trends are clear. When you have more power going through the scraper player, you have more peak heat flux hitting the outer diverter plate. And as David said, if the outer diverter plate survives the material limit of 10 megawatts per meter squared, so too will the inner plate owing to the power ratio between the plates. Another trend is observed that at higher impurity fractions, the peak heat fluxes decreases too. Therefore, in the bottom left region of this graph, in the white region, there is a clear operating space for our reactor, which has a consistent diverter solution. All right. So as we've seen, the locations of the colloidal field coils and the optimal position of the strike plates are pretty well determined by our physics and calculations. So this means that we have a fairly slim area where we can actually- Oh, this all has happened. Oh, wow. Well, um, we have a fairly slim area where we can fit the rest of the cooling solution and the, the fly blend around the back of the vessel. So, in order to pursue this modular design, we put the coil field coils in their own prior 
vessels down so that they can be temperature controlled, where the rest of the vacuum vessel has been built into and around the vacuum vessel. This allows us to feed in the fly coolant that we need through the colloidal field partitions and exhaust into the tank as a reservoir. Here you can see that we're pumping in from the top and pushing to the bottom where we're exhausting our coolant into the base. This gives us a strong natural circulation and improves the heat transfer. And then for the diverter specifically, we have dedicated pipes that come in at the same horizontal colloidal level and exhaust uh, further along the floors. So I'll hand it off now with it to Calvin to talk about how we accomplish the fluid simulation and the results. Thanks, Julia. So taking that same thing that we saw in the last slide, um, sort of turning it around so we can see the plasma facing in, uh, we see the strike point, which uh, we got from U edge. Uh, we have a, a peak right in that middle, which is going to really dominate our, our cooling. And so taking a cross section, looking for, we added a fin right at that strike point or close to it uh, to improve heat transfer in that area. So what did it actually look like when we put fly through the diverter? Well, we see that as expected, you have the highest temperatures right towards the center where the heat flux is, uh, but all along the plate, our maximum temperature is below the recrystallization temperature of tungsten, which is around 1200 C. Uh, that is that is the critical temperature that if you get below uh, above that, your tungsten will start to fail. Uh, so we're very happy to see that by, by adding that fin, we can keep the entire diverter plate intact uh, with with the heat flux profiles that we have. And sort of as Andres brought up earlier, we can't just cool diverter plates. Uh, the radiated heating means that we also need to actually cool the vacuum vessel. So what we have is a centimeter of a vacuum vessel wall, which is made of a medium from new steel, a fly channel that runs down, and then another wall which separates that channel from the blanket. Um, and so the critical temperature for that steel alloy that we're using for the plasma facing component is 800 C. Um, and so we can see that by having that fly channel there, uh, we are able to successfully keep the entire vacuum vessel below that critical temperature, uh, and we can sustain operation without material failure. So I'll hand it off now to Steve. So the major component which our team designed was the blanket, which is designed to capture the heat that comes off of the uh, fusion reactions, read additional tritium to fuel the reactor, and shield the rest of the components from the high energy neutrons produced by the fusion. Um, so our analysis sets sort of constraints on various other components and provides a couple of key points that the deposition in various components from nuclear heating, radiation damage, and therefore component lifetimes, uh, activation, so the buildup of uh, radionuclides for things like maintenance, and then the tritium breeding ratio that sets our fuel inventory and fuel cycle limits. Uh, all of our analysis here was conducted using OpenMC. You can see our completed neutronics model here uh, on the right. I'll point out some of the key components. So we modeled the PF magnet, the fly blanket, vacuum vessel, um, and then the surrounding our blanket tank, we placed some additional layers of dedicated shielding for neutrons, the suction carbide and boron, uh, boron carbide shielding. So we selected our materials very, very carefully. We wanted advanced but realistic materials that allow us to keep the device compact while keeping the activation low. So for the vacuum vessel, we selected a vanadium from the titanium alloy because of its combination of low activation, High temperature resistance and its technological readiness level, which we'll discuss in more detail. Obviously, we're choosing fly as our coolant solution for our liquid inversion blanket, and we use boron uh, carbide and tungsten carbide as our primary shielding materials. So, just to give a little more detail on the decision that went into uh, selecting the vacuum vessel material, um, which is one of the key components for the Fermanta. Um, there are several design constraints that we have when selecting this material. Um, one of the key ones is the high operating temperature of the fly molten salt flowing around the reactor. But obviously, we also need to be concerned about good ductility, about radiation resistance and low activation in this environment. Corrosion resistance, especially in the flight environment, is important. And as John mentioned, we want a techn technological readiness level that's as high as possible. So if we reference this plot on the right, you can see several uh, candidate materials plotted with their operating temperature windows. And if Whoever's controlling the slides can click. You can see here um, that we've overlaid the Manta operating window on this plot. 
Um, and that identifies basically four materials that we could potentially use for the vacuum vessel. Um, the first one, the niobium zirconium carbon um, alloy is unsuitable because of its high activation. But basically these other three materials are very interesting for Manta and for um, potential future commercial power plants. Um, and based on these materials, we've selected a basically three-step plan, starting with the vanadium, chromium, titanium alloy that John mentioned, um, and moving to the ODS ferritic steel and silicon carbide based on their technological readiness level to understand the constraints and options that we have for future power plants. Next slide. Um, moving from materials to geometry optimization, um, when designing the blanket, uh, we basically wanted to make sure that all of the neutron heat was deposited mostly into the blanket and not in the other components. So if you advance the slide, you can see overlaid on this contour plot of the local volumetric heating from the neutrons, um, an overlay of the blanket geometry. So we basically, as I mentioned, tried to capture as much of that heat in the blanket um, and not in the other components. Um, you can see the breakdown of this heat on the right side, um, the fusion power produced by Manta, um, the nuclear heating um, that takes into account secondary photons in the blanket, the auxiliary heating, the auxiliary heating power from the RF system, and then the total thermal power in the system. And all of these numbers lead to a power multiplication factor in the blanket of 1.11, which is important for economics constraints. Next slide. Okay. So we also performed an analysis of how long the magnets would last based on how much fusion energy the device produced. So we set ourselves a target lifetime of 1,000 megawatt years, which had a peak fusion of about 400 megawatt, corresponds to two and a half full power years of operation. Uh, this lifetime was computed based on what we know about how Repco reacts in neutron fields for the time being. So we had to keep the lifetime fluence through any Repco magnet below three times 10 to the 18 neutrons per square centimeter. That's what set the lifetime of these components. Uh, this requirement of 1,000 megawatt years of life is met or exceeded on all points of the TF magnet. You can see by this plot on the right. Basically, everywhere you see red is 1,000 megawatts, uh, megawatt years or below. Um, but our PF magnets could not get to meet the lifetime goal. Um, their average lifetimes at times were above the requirement, but if you look closely, you'll see that a number of them um, have points that are well below the 1,000 megawatt year lifetime. So these components will likely need to be replaceable, which motivated the design um, of our PF cryostat and various systems to make these components replaceable uh, with the machine as it uh, progresses. Uh, so moving from the lifetime of the magnet systems, we also looked at the lifetime of the vacuum vessel. Um, there isn't actually good data on uh, the specific failure time of uh, the vacuum vessel material based on neutron damage. But we did analyze the DPA anyways, um, and we get a DPA of about two on the vacuum vessel. Um, this is predicted to be within the acceptable range for lifetime uh, within a year of operation. Uh, but true lifetime limits of the vacuum vessel are something that would need to be determined by operation of this plant. Um, it's unclear exactly how long they would last. Uh, we also looked at activation of the vacuum vessel to see what sort of uh, radiological risk this might have once uh, the vacuum vessel does meet its lifetime when we remove it. Um, so we did a two-step uh, method to compute the gamma dose from the activation of the tungsten and vanadium from the titanium alloy in the vacuum vessel. Um, we ran this for 400, uh, at 400 megawatts for four years, so much longer than this would likely last. Um, and then we did gamma transport on those uh, photons as they were produced in the vacuum vessel outwards. And we see that um, the blanket tank is basically completely capable of blocking those. Um, we get a dose rate that is on the order of hundreds of millirem per hour at the outer surface of the blanket tank. So once removed, um, it's extremely well shielded. So another primary function of the blanket is the tritium breeding function. Um, and TBR, the tritium breeding ratio, is an important quantity because it determines not only the mass of tritium that is required to start up the reactor, but also the self-sufficiency of the plant over time. Um, so similar to the optimization that was done based on uh, heat deposition contours, we can create global contours of the uh, TBR in Manta um, in order to optimize the blanket geometry. So these contours indicate basically the smallest blanket geometry that would be um, allowable in order to achieve the um, indicated TBR. Um, so using this optimization, we were able to achieve a TBR of 1.11, which as Nigel and Cody will talk about in the coming slides, um, allows self-sufficiency of the plan. Next slide.
In addition, as was mentioned earlier, um, we worked with the core team in order to optimize the RF heating system launcher position. Um, so model at the right here is basically the worst case scenario for the geometry um, in terms of the feed through of the system. So in this area that's highlighted by this kind of mustard color, the blanket material has been replaced with a copper alloy at half density. Um, and this extends about one third of the toroidal direction around Manta. Um, and this is, um, again, basically meant to model the worst case scenario feed through geometry that we would have. Um, the inclusion of this system obviously reduces TBR because of the displacement of the blanket material in this region. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this uh, design isn't optimized. Uh, the final design would avoid neutron streaming paths directly from the plasma to the TF coils. Um, but even with the inclusion of this worst case scenario system, we achieve a TBR of 1.1, which um, again, as Nigel and Cody will talk about, is self-sufficient. Um, moving on from OpenMC to a fuel cycle, a TBR of 1.1, which was the TBR of the worst case geometry, enables startup of additional fusion power plants. Um, showing tritium self-sufficiency is an important step in proving the economic viability of fusion power. And so we modeled ours using Simulink to uh, track our tritium over time. And uh, a TBR greater than 1.02 is required for self-sufficiency, where enough tritium is produced to fuel Manta. Uh, you can see this on the plot on the right, where we plot the tritium, the tritium amount required for a power plant over 2.5 years at different TBRs. And uh, for a TBR of 0 0.9, um, you're clearly not self-sufficient. And in fact, you'll need about 7 kilograms over the lifetime of your plant. For a TBR of one, you're still losing some tritium due to slight inefficiencies of your fuel cycle, but the amount required is a lot less. However, for a TBR of 1.1, as you can see, you're producing more tritium than Manta needs. And in fact, you can use that to uh, um, generate startup inventory for another reactor. Next slide. And so to summarize the Simulink model that um, we used, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a summary in the not bold of um, parameters taken from other groups. So the tritium breeding ratio, the fusion power. Uh, the availability factor is a measure of uh, related to the maintenance cycle. So the maintenance team will talk about that later on. And so what we found is that using a startup inventory of only 500 grams, um, if we continually pump tritium out of the system, either to create startup inventories or possibly even to sell later on, uh, we can do that and maintain a reserve tritium inventory of 75 grams in the system in case of um, uh, failures of any point in the fuel cycle or any leaks or anything like that. And what we find is that um, once the reactor is turned on and all the tritium is in the starts in the storage, it, the system only takes about a week to completely equilibrate to steady state. And over a plant lifetime of 2.5 years, uh, we're able to produce a net of uh, 4.7 kilograms, which um, for Manta class devices that only need half a, uh, half a kilogram can produce about seven to nine, depending on the uh, TBR fluctuation, if we include an RF heating system or not. Um, but this would likely change if uh, we're, we use Manta as a seed plant for other uh, commercial class reactors which would have different startup inventories, uh, possibly larger due to having just the bigger fuel system. All right, Magnet team's back. We are also responsible for the maintenance plan for Manta. So the key thing that we absolutely have to do is we have to be able to replace the wearable vacuum vessel due to the electronics um, considerations mentioned earlier. And the other big thing is we need to ensure operational certainty by maintain, minimizing downtime. This is a power plant, not a science experiment, um, and time is money. The overarching strategy is we are proposing replacing the vacuum vessel and blanket tank assembly together. Both components that are shown right here. This helps with a few things. First off, uh, the blanket tank provides shielding against, uh, against the radioactivity of the vacuum vessel. Uh, the other big thing is you don't have to take, uh, take apart the blanket tank and put it back together. Um, and do that in a way that is which helps simplify the maintenance scheme. And we are also specking a very large cloud plant, um, large in the sense it has 1.5 megawatts of surge capacity cooling, 
while we are actually producing fusion energy though, we will only be consuming about 13 kilowatts. The 1.5 megawatts is for shorter durations. This animation shows the concept of operations for dead maintenance. Uh, we talked about the amount of ball bag as before. Here, you see how it allows us to just take the top off. And then the upper PF separates from the blanket and tank. Lower PFs cannot really stay in there unless the tank. Do the swap and get back to operations, make energy. Ah, there we are. So as uh, Alan mentioned, uh, we are scoping an oversized cryo plant for this device to target a replacement time of one month. So in order to do this uh, re replacement cycle, we need to follow these steps that you see here on the left. Uh, the most time consuming ones are the first two. So charging and discharging the torpedo field coils and warming up and cooling down the crowd staff. So non-insulated magnets take a long time generally to ramp up and ramp down. So if we try to extrapolate from the toroidal field model coil experiment, uh, we'd be expecting about three months to do just that step. Uh, warming up and cooling down the crest also typically takes long in current devices. So two months total for uh, K-Star and Eater. Um, so that would leave us with a uh, maintenance time of over five months, uh, which is not really compatible with the mission of uh, proving that this can be a commercially viable product. Um, so uh, we have done some calculations showing that with this oversized cryo plant, we can get the um, most time consuming steps down to less than two weeks each, giving us a total of about one month uh, replacement time. Uh, so why is this the case? Why is it that fast replacement requires a large cryo plant? Well, two reasons. Um, so the rate limiting effects here are, first of all, the radial current heating during TF charge and discharge, which is shown here. So the radial currents here are currents that go from one HGS tape to the other through the steel that they're embedded in. Um, and then the other uh, problem here is uh, the thermal stresses on the torpedo field coils when the cryostat is warming up and cooling down. So we can kill two birds with one stone here with a large cryo plant with a uh, large amount of uh, cryogenic power. So just to note, we have a liquid nitrogen pre-coolant just for under cooling down and a hydrogen coolant operating at 20 Kelvin uh, with a maximum mass flow rate of 15 kilograms per second. So to show you what this looks like over time, on the top here, we're showing the toroidal field coil temperatures um, over time. In the bottom, we're showing the warming and cooling power also over at the same time. So when we're starting with our energy production phase, we're operating at 20 Kelvin uh, with uh, 13 kilowatts of power. You see that once we start discharging the torpedo field coils to start the maintenance cycle, all of a sudden we require a lot more cooling power, 200 kilowatts. Um, then when we're ready to start warming up, uh, we eventually crank up the power to 1.5 megawatts here, um, allowing us to get to room temperature quickly. We do the swap, um, and then we start cooling back down. Again, starting at about 1.5 megawatts, going down to uh, the point where we can start using 200 megawatts, 200 kilowatts, excuse me, of power. And while we're charging the torpedo field walls. And then finally, when we're ready to do our energy production, we can go back down to 13 kilowatts of power. So, uh, well, so what we're seeing here is that the peak heating and cooling power are far behind beyond the needs of our fusion operation requirements. Um, this will be an expense, but it will pay for itself in a couple cycles. Um, and on that note, we'll hand it off to the economics group. Okay, so let's talk about the economics and balance of plant. So we, move the, we know that we can produce a nominal, a nominal power of 395 megawatts. So how do we turn that into electricity? We have designed a primary life cycle because of electronics and thermal properties that would operate between 500 Celsius and 600 Celsius, which falls within the operating temperatures of the rest of the materials. Because of the fact that life is expensive and that it contains regime, we want to minimize the, the exposure of the minimize exposure of the systems to fly. So we are using a secondary molten cycle salt. For that, we are using a solar cell, which is a nitrate mixture 
just April of 14, our temperatures close to the hot level of the flag cycle without boiling, and at the same time, close to the cold leg of the ranking cycle without freezing. Then we put the power into the ranking cycle, which has been the optimal uh, layout for inverted temperatures, and doing an optimization for uh, with with repeating of the cycle, we get perhaps a critical optimization that's going up to 150 bars. We get an efficiency of approximately 36 percent, and for a supercritical optimization up to 300 bar, we get 38.5 percent. This allows us to pour approximately 110 megawatts of electricity into the grid. So, given the fact that the plasma is uh, has pulses of around 53 minutes. We want we have designed a thermal storage system which would allow to operate it to operate the cycles close to steady state and produce a constant amount of electricity over time. So when the plasma is on, it's pouring approximately 424 megawatts into a secondary cycle. 410 megawatts of those are being transferred to a ranking cycle, but 14 megawatts are being transferred from molten salt, which is being pumped to a cold tank to a hot tank, so that during the 100 approximately 100 seconds of it. That the core is off, we're going to pump back this hot tank solar salt to the cold tank and transfer the power to the ranking cycle so that we get an average, a constant uh, average power of 410 megawatts. Okay, so, after putting this all together, uh, we find that our thermal plant design indeed meets the requirements of the NACE report, which are that we have a P electric of more than 50 megawatts and Q electric greater than one. So as we work through the core, starting from a few fusion of around 400 megawatts thermal, and moving through the blanket with multiplication factor of 1.1, and then including the effects of the thermal storage that Miguel just spoke about and heat exchanger effectiveness, the power that arrives at the ranking cycle is around 410 megawatts thermal. And in our analysis, this produces for a subcritical ranking cycle 140 megawatts electric total, and for a supercritical ranking cycle 150 megawatts electric total. And so now taking into account the power budget shown here in the view on the right, where we include the sort of heating power, cryogenic power, time integrated, and pumping power of the system, we find that for both plants, around 110 or 115 megawatts electric are available in the grid. And so we conclude that both these uh, approaches, subcritical and supercritical, would uh, be viable for a for a pilot plant, and is it significant because it allows a comparison between between uh, greenfield and brownfield siting, which we're going to talk about. Uh, one of the NASA report requirements is that the pilot plant costs less than five billion dollars. Um, we use a model that is a combination of bottom-up costing, top-down costing, and in input from industry experts to estimate the cost of our device. The overnight cost is around $3 billion, uh, which puts us at about $25 million per megawatt electric, which is actually comparable to a uh, wind pilot plant that was built in 2020. So this is on a very feasible scale of this. Um, the Sheffield model is commonly used for costing fusion pilot plans. Uh, we see pretty good agreement between this and our costing approach. Um, and in total, we expect that uh, the TF magnets will be the biggest driver of cost with other contributions like heating and bill of the plant uh, being major contributors. So as mentioned, our greenfield cost estimate for this plant uh, is right over $3 billion. Uh, but what we look to do is reduce that cost further in order to make this more attractive uh, to build. So what we considered was what additional costs we may incur by brownfielding and what costs we may save. Um, so as you can see, uh, we estimate uh, the costs as depicted for uh, the turbine, the electrical plant, uh, and the construction costs associated with savings on building uh, those components. Uh, additionally, there may be additional costs uh, in the case of repurposing, for example, a coal, a coal legacy plant or oil legacy plant, there may be additional cleanup costs. Um, so using uh, an estimate based on 150 megawatt electric uh, coal plant, uh, we came up with an estimated $232 million in cost savings for brownfield versus greenfield. Uh, additionally, from the other perspective of energy justice, this is an opportunity uh, to repurpose a net uh, 
polluter in the community to become a net benefit. So you have the opportunity to retain jobs in the community, and the opportunity to uh, eliminate that polluter, and then also put that community on the forefront of scientific advance uh, as a way to uh, inform kids, uh, in, informed consent based society. So, um, as the previous groups uh, have hopefully convinced you, uh, the Manta project not only meets but exceeds the requirements as laid out in the NASIM report. But we asked ourselves then, can we do even better? Um, so, what if instead of as a you know as as a, as a science pilot, what if Manta were run as a full power plant? We consider revenue streams from electricity and as well the selling of tritium, about 3% of total revenue. Um, we consider power consumption from various subsystems, predominantly heating and the cryo plant. Uh, we consider operations and maintenance, standard financing assumptions, and having a, a capacity factor set by the lifetime of the magnets uh, and the central solenoid pulse time. All of these together, we generate for a one TF magnet lifetime multiple environmental cycle project of 2.5 years, a net cost of approximately $2.6 billion, which you will note is just, un just above half of the limit as set out by the NASIM report. We then ask with this techno-economic model um, that we have developed, can we go even further? If we scale up the Manta project just beyond our physics operating limit, but within our Greenwald limit, um, to we scale up core power by 1.5 times to a 600 megawatts um, fusion core. Our scalings uh, from 400 megawatts fusion uh, and a 25-year um, project, it was times 10 on the, on the lifetime of the project, we generate 227 megawatts electric power with a levelized cost of electricity um, that puts us profitable uh, in most of the U uh, United States electricity markets, such as for comparison, the uh, New York and Boston metropolitan areas, although still not uh, cost competitive with respect to existing electricity generation technologies. However, we feel um, that, that this uh, project, the Manta project, which is designed to be a pilot, having it be profitable but not competitive is exactly what we need um, and an extremely positive outcome of our work. Next slide, please. So as an outcome of the class, we can conclude that the nation requirements were exceeded. We wanted to produce more than 50 megawatts of electricity at a cost below $5 billion, and with an electric gain factor of order or higher than one. And we have attained 110 megawatts of electricity at a cost around $3 billion, and for a gain factor around five. So if you compare the parameters, that we need to target it with the ones that we obtain. We can say that we comply with the 1,000 megawatts a year lifetime that we wanted. We have increased efficient power from 200 megawatts to 395 megawatts. We wanted to produce electricity for around 1,000 cycles, and we have designed the plan to operate in steady state. The availability factor was set to be 0 0.9, and if the plant were to operate as an industrial power plant, it would be able to achieve 0 0.92. The QP increased from 15 to 39. The power into the diverter was successfully kept at 25 megawatts, around 25 megawatts. The magnetic field on coil, on the toroidal field coil, was increased from 21 teslas to 40 to 24 teslas. And the treating reading ratio, which had to be around or above one, has been designed to be of 1.1. Just to summarize some of the key sort of uh, innovations and types that we have, member class, um, that we're able to meet and exceed all of the National Academy of Science of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics report requirements by uh, coming up with a self-consistent physics model that leverages large aspect ratio, low elongation, and negative triangularity to ensure large variable fusion power output while keeping a constant diverter power exhaust rate. Uh, we have a pulse plasma design, but we have constant electricity output by having thermal storage in our thermal cycle. Um, due to the modular design of the reactor, we have a flexible replacement strategy that allows us to iterate different uh, vacuum dust designs and things like that of multiple environmental cycles. And we found through neutronic simulations that we are tritium self-sufficient uh, and can actually generate excess tritium to start a fusion industry. It's the end of our presentation. Oh, 
Oh, great job, students. So we're going to take some questions, Carlos. Perhaps you can uh, you can uh, chair from the Columbia side if there's students and there's questions from your side as well, too. Okay. And if you don't mind looking online, this is I don't have a laptop. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, so on, on the guys that were with the fly part, how do you let the fly to stick to the to the to the wall? I'm sorry, is it please restate the question? Yeah, so the fly. So they have it like we're going through the to that to a vessel, right? Like sticking to the wall. How do you get to that? I think what you're, there, there's a cooling channel etched into the vacuum vessel that the fly passes through. So there's material on either side that's confining it to the vacuum. Okay. Okay. Also, I had a question regarding uh, the levelized coats. Very good. Um, does that include the replacement stuff? Is that that 150 bucks is that, that it does include replacing the materials, the parts that you said you had to replace, or is that just um, regular operation? Um, that that does that includes the cost of replace so for the um for the 2.5 year project that includes the, that it includes the, the model includes the cost of replacing the magnets but that is for one tf lifetime um for the extended projection to a 25 year project that also includes the cost of replacing um the toroidal field magnets we have a question on over here okay thanks professor Mall. Wow, I'm really <laughs> impressed everyone. You did a great job. It's just super. Um, I, my question is, what next? Are you putting together a report? Is this going to be distributed to others in the community? It's really well done. And I'm like interested to know what you're going to do next. We're <laughs> looking puzzled. So, um, Carlos, Carlos uh, thanks for really appreciating that comment. And so, some short switch for the students. So, uh, they really work amazingly hard at this. Um, I think the idea, Mike, is that uh, well, we, we're going to, there's still a little bit more work to do. And, uh, and Carlos had the great idea that this would be presented to the, to the US VPO, the Burning Plasma Organization, because they're having a series of pilot designs right now. So I think that the idea would be to port this back to that meeting, and the students would be able to present it there to the point of national audience. No pressure. <laughs> yes. Hopefully it matures into a publication also. Into a publication, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Alex? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to ask. Well, first, really nice work. Really impressive. Uh, you showed the cool uh, TF coil design. And, but then, like, you, you had that at the beginning, and then later on, you were modeling it just as the oval shape. And I was just curious is there like a really negligible effect of having? That extra, like you at the top, and for the magnetic equilibrium and up down asymmetry, things like that. Uh, do you just ignore it? Can it be ignored? From a neutronics perspective, I think actually our assumption of just making it elliptical um, is conservative because you're, you're actually pushing the TF stuff farther away. I think we chose that shape um, also because you know there will be steel material there that will be supporting it. But I think for us, it is actually conservative, the geometry that we assume. And going with the horn shape actually, if anything, it proves the light. What about other things like the, we have a model the effect on the equilibrium? Yeah. In terms of 3 gs it just takes in the field of axis. So, assuming the field of axis doesn't change, which I don't believe it would, since we got that number from Michael's simulations with, I believe, the, the top view in place, uh, that will not affect the 3 gs simulations. Perhaps uh, a, a question about the uh, the ripple that's arising. Anybody want to take that one on? I know that you're considering the thing this time. I look at Ripple due to the radio current, and that's just managing the radio resistance for the strong resistances. And, and that, that the contribution of Ripple from that is uh, is below about five percent. Uh, I don't know if Michael looked at Ripple due to geometry. That would be that would be wrong. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So we do not have a model for quench dynamics. Uh, that is just sort of uh, something that we were told that uh, the PSFC and CFS are working on right now, but we don't have those tools. That was a bridge too far. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it that in place. But that's the idea that we would implement those strategies that we're testing up top. Any more? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, really nice part. Really impressive design. Um, I'm curious on the tritium-free ratio. How close do 
close are we to to this uh, this limit? We you're at one point one one or one point one seven, which is great. Um, thinking about ports that might need to be put in there, or like maybe other things that could be in the back of the vessel that we're not considering. Uh, how close to that? Yeah. And just overall, so though, if you couldn't hear that, so it was just a question. How realistic was the TPR when you add other basically exclusions into the blank? Yeah, so um, we we presented basically the worst case scenario um, for the RF system specifically. Um, that being said, as you point out, as we make the design even more realistic with other subsystems that might have to go through the vessel, um, it'll probably decrease slightly. But again, as the um, as Nigel and Cody showed, um, we have a good margin in terms of self-sufficiency. Um, so we still predict that we'll be in good shape even after the inclusion of a more realistic design. I'd, I'd like to add to that too. Um, even though the, the reactor will likely still be self-sufficient all because all it needs is a TBR greater than 1.02, uh, the TBR as far as ex, uh, excess tritium production beyond that is fairly sensitive to the TBR. So a reduction of 0 0.01 uh, from the RF to the, uh, which was the difference of including this RF system or not, uh, it reduced the um, achievable like additional tritium by I think around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 kilograms over its entire life cycle. So that would be also another consideration to make and uh, that it would be necessary to optimize these things to keep the TBR as high as possible. <laughs> a, a technical revelation in this one is about how important in this design it has such robust TBR because there's fly right up close to the spin the spectrum. So, by the way, for those who are interested, zero enrichment to this fly. So, to lithium enrichment, that's just natural. But you're just actually better, but not for a whole bunch of reasons. Yeah. Okay. Anybody online? Hello, Lucas. We have two, two oh. questions online. One from Lucas Spag yeah. Spanish. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, hey, um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, nice presentation. Um, by no means am I a subject expert here. Uh, in fact, I'm interviewing for a postdoc at uh, the PFSC, but I'm coming from ML. But um, uh, I, I was surprised not to hear any discussion of, like formal discussion of caveats and, and really many of the sections. Can you like talk a little bit about what are some of the unforeseen um, risks that you're anticipating or like unaccounted for combinatoric effects or something like that? That's it's a really good question. I mean, maybe a couple of the groups you can comment maybe as to what, you're, what you would lose sleep over about this design. Yeah, I can take something from the diverter power handling group. We have been using a rough mock-up of live tight joints uh, for, the, uh, for the cooling. I think we've been using technology for molten salt reactors to investigate flanges, ceiling systems. But I think that really getting to fly at these temperatures behind tungsten this hot, I think that will be an area of research in the future. Excellent. Anyone else want to comment? Perhaps from the magnet group, I think we have to be very careful with boundary condition when we set up our stress simulations and having a gradually more realistic um, solution for the different supports and, and the shapes of, and, and, and how those are you know, uh, tied to the grounds or, or, or fixed boundaries uh, will really help get to something that we can really trust and, and bang on. Any other group want to comment? I can also comment from the economic side of things. Um, the scaling of how much it costs to go from material to an actually fabricated item is rather uncertain. Uh, so that could definitely change cost greatly. Also, there's the question of the finance model, how you actually get the money to build the reactor. <laughs> it's always the money. <laughs> yeah. Just one thing I learned from the core group, which is actually the elongation was not self consistently uh, calculated, including the internal inductance of the plasma. And given that the core scenario is actually quite uh, sensitive to this, we really need a full self consistent vertical stability modeling, which will happen further work. Yeah. And then from maintenance side, we're worried about unscheduled maintenance caused by disruption. We weren't able to look at that. It's always disruption. <laughs> yeah. And Tony, I had a question from last site. Tony Chen. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, great presentation, everyone. It's really nice to see how this turned out. Very impressive work. 
Um, one of the nice things about this reactor is the variable power, which comes from controlling density and impurities. So I, I want to ask, um, did uh, two questions. Did you scope out um, particle fueling, like pellet injection or, or gas puff, with specific requirements? And also, did you look at um, core uh, particle transport with kinetic um, trendy GX and in capacity? <laughs> So we began our we began our uh, kinetic electron runs in Trinity, and we ran into some issues. We couldn't model the effect of impurities in improving the confinement factor, which is uh, is a big uh, factor. And so some of our earlier runs were not going really terrific, but we basically have to wait until multiple species can be added to. Trinity GX, which is a capability it has, it just needs to be put into place. And then we can get a consistent picture with our operating scenario. Then we wanted fueling. Yeah, uh, because we're operating in L mode, we can get away with gas pumping to fuel the impurities because there's no um, large pedestal. But you hear that? It's gas pumping, it's L mode. Things roll bad, L mode good. <laughs> <laughs> Is there uh, anything more specific you can say about the gas puff, like specific requirements on flow or actuation or time? Uh, um, well, the diverter group actually probably indicated the aspects of what the pumping would look like, but those are not presented in detail. In fact, that's probably one of the things that we want to uh, we want to show up a little bit because those are difficult calculations. But that's probably the most important thing, Tony, is because. What this is clearly telling us is that we're going to get robustly attached high high neutral gas diverter divert volumes, and what we need to do a little bit more work on actually what that means for for, for ash exhaust and for particle exhaust. Yeah, push you should have push pull control on this for simple gas pumping and diverter and diverter pumping and gas pumping. I'm really excited about that. It's it's, it's actually completely. Underlooked that problem and control of huge. And in the end, it's, it's critical because this actually impacts very strongly the treating inventory in the plant. That's truly really so. Great questions. Anything else from here? Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Great job. Uh, to everyone. Anything from the round the table at Columbia there, uh, Carlos? We have one more question in the room here. Fantastic. Hi, I have another tritium question. Did you select a method for tritium extraction from the fly, and does that have significant power requirements? What were the power, I mean, I'll, I'll, it's a good question. What were the power requirements of the fly itself? Were those considered? Uh, I mean, certainly the fly. Fly was circulated, so there's some pumping power. Mostly we, we assume the same pressure drop through the Diverter through those four channels and then through heat exchangers. Yep. So we didn't model all, all of the uh, types in the system. And those are included in the power of the pumping that I showed a little bit earlier. Uh, but there's there uh, power requirement for trading extraction. Yeah. So it's a little bit TB. It's a great question. It's a little bit TBD. This is why we're starting the Libra experiment here at MIT. It's one of the reasons is to try to start getting a handle on it. But likely, it's likely that the the concept here would be that as the fly was circulated out of the uh, tank uh, and out to the heat exchanger, it's something like in the heat exchanger or secondary system that will be trying to extract the tritium every time it passes through. But we don't we don't know the details of that. Yeah, that's what we're working on. Great questions. Okay. Well, actually, and again, I want to really thank. Everyone who was a group leader, please stick up your hand here so we can acknowledge you. Of what we're talking about. Fantastic. And again, another of uh, all, well, I actually want to thank our, our colleagues at Columbia. We figured out how to, how to do this with a few uh, a few sticky points of communication, but, but thank you for all your patience and for your amazing contributions. And this, and it was so fun that we were able to do this together as institutions. And thank you, Carlos, for your support from Columbia. So for the pleasure. It's been fun. Thanks to students again. Spectacular job, everyone. What grade should I give them? Maybe I should just do a little quick. <laughs> well, Dennis, I told them if they went over time, every goal we missed in the World Cup. 
Thank you, everyone. You guys keep us on our toes. It was really spectacular work. The way that you work together, you learn so much. But you also, like, it, it shouldn't surprise me every time this class happens. This taught me a lot as well. So thank you so much. Get it. Yeah. Yeah.